Okay, you guys, we're, um, let me just do this. Just right. I get the right thing. That button didn't work. Anyway, <laughs> we're about to start. I just wanted to be uh, streaming right now. As soon as uh, Marcus is ready, I'm going to switch over to him on my screen. You can ignore that agenda if you want. That's just my, what I'm planning on working on today. Um, hello, everybody. I'm the guy sitting behind the desk, behind the words. Hello. Um, this uh, journal club is just about to start. And I just wanted to uh, jump in here. Let me turn this off. Turn that off. Turn that off. Hello. Hello, folks. Um, give me just a minute. Let me see if I can get chat working here. We do have a chat room, and it's supposed to show up. There we go. Hello, Mark. Okay, we're on the air. There's no room anywhere else for the on air. Yeah, if I get Okay, we're on air. All right, we good, Matt? I said yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a review of this paper that I'll talk about in a second. Um, just background, um, one way of framing why I'm presenting this, why I'm talking about this paper, is that um, we've spent a lot of years focusing on the ways that uh, deep networks are different from Cortex, uh, which there are many. Um, but right now we're at a time when it, it's actually useful to us to focus on the ways that they're the same. Uh, because if we want to apply insights from uh, from neuroscience to like convolutional neural nets, for example, then it's suddenly really useful to know um, if they're the same. So, or if, if, there, if there are similarities between them. So that, anyway, background. Um, so this paper is um, performance optimized hierarchical models predict neural responses in higher visual cortex. Uh, it's, from, it's from the DiCarlo lab at MIT. Uh, the co first the authors were Dan Yamans and Ha Hong. And, um, so this paper kind of made a splash back in 2014. Um, and that, since then, for example, Dan Yeaman's got a faculty position at Stanford. He now runs a lab that does this kind of research. Uh, so so it, like, it made an impact. It, it, it did some, it, it has an impressive result. Uh, so like, kind of just to discuss my mental model and, and come back and talk about like um, the similarities between uh, deep, artificial neural networks and uh, and the cortex. Uh, is that how this paper is structured or is this you're saying? No, no, this is me. You're saying, okay, so before we talk about what's in this paper, you're going to give how you're thinking about it. Yes, yes. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I drew an axis on the board uh, showing like how similar are deep, ne deep networks and cortex. Um, and I've, I've refined that axis instead of it's to a two by two uh, grid so that it would be compatible with everyone's mental model. Uh, and so, so here, one of these axes on this two by two grid is, um, is the overall computation of, of a deep artificial neural network. For example, a convolutional neural network. Um, does it approximate what's happening in cortex? Yes or no? Um, and so this is kind of a top down question. And then this is more of a bottom up question of are the units, are they using kind of the same building blocks? Are, are these networks built on similar building blocks as cortical networks? Uh, and, uh, and the answer to this question can vary by task and the model. Uh, and the paper, this paper, I would say uh, pretty uh, like um, strongly uh, votes for uh, uh, at the very least, convolutional neural networks are doing something quite similar to cortex in the case of viewing static images. Uh, and, and I'll talk about um, I'll talk about what I'm. There's some particulars here that are interesting. Like the, uh, when when I get down to here, it'll be interesting to talk about. Um, now, but just to disclaim the obvious, it's not even attempting to. What's up? But just so I understand that. So you're saying even for approximating single cortical neurons. 
uh, do deep ANN units approximate single cortical neurons? It, I would say it doesn't. It says yes. It doesn't. Uh, uh, this experiment doesn't distinguish between whether uh, the units are. Okay. So it really doesn't say anything about it. I, that's what I was wondering is like, why put these two things on an axis? It's not clear at all to me that they belong together, like it's uh, like a two dimensional grid. It's like they're sort of separate questions. Separate questions. Yeah. So as you're just saying here, the question whether it's doing the same computation overall, it really doesn't tell you anything about the neurons. So you're, you're saying it doesn't, right? So it's, uh, right. It's, it's not clear that that belongs on a two by two grid, but we can do it that way. So I guess the reason I did it was that, um, was, so, so yeah, I mean, here, just briefly, the, yeah, I'll jump down here. Um, we could do that, maybe you're saying. Yeah. We could bring in the neurons into the, into a more realistic neuron into that deep learning network model. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're going No, to? I was going to say uh, that um, if, if we want to understand whether, um, <clears throat> if we want to understand whether we should bring things like, here, I'll just I'll, I'll say this example. Should convolutional neural networks use sparse representations? Um, if if both of these things are true, if yes and yes, um, then the answer is almost certainly yes. Um, if the overall computation is the same, but the but the way it's doing it is quite different, it's unclear. And if the if the building blocks of the individual units are similar, but the overall computation is different, then it's unclear. Um, and so this is why I, why I group this all together. Like in what ways are deep neural networks the same as the cortical networks. Right. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Um, it, it sounds like we're not, it sounds like you think a little differently about it. The rest of this doesn't depend on yeah. that. That was me justifying. It, again, the, it depends what the goals are. If the goal is to have deep learning systems that approximate what's going on in experimental results, or maybe very closely, then that might be true. Right, but for example, we're not trying to do that at all. Right. right, we're trying to use insights from neuroscience to improve machine intelligence, which is going in a different direction, if that makes sense. Like, we're not trying to match specific experimental results or anything like that. Okay, um, okay. so right. that this assumes that of the bigger goal of trying to say, okay, do, do these artificial systems, how closely can they match neural responses? Under, so, the, under that goal that uh, this is... No, that's not the goal I wrote this under. I'm, okay. I'm talking, we want to improve convolutional neural networks using insights from neuroscience. Uh, yeah. So one of the things, and one of the observations from neuroscience are that representations in the brain are sparse. Uh, and is that applicable to convolutional neural networks? Will they improve if we add sparsity? Uh, and I'm saying that the answer to that question depends on how similar the two are. are. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. not. See that? Yeah, that's I the mean, that's the leap. Gone. That's the leap. That, that last bit is what I'm unsure I see. about. I see. Yeah, you're right that it's not um, decisive. It, 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 but for example, yeah, I mean, yeah. mathematically sparse representations would have a lot of yeah. value independent of whether it mimics the, you know neural responses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As an example. Okay, now I'll actually talk about the paper. Uh, so, uh, brief summary: they have a four-layer convolutional neural network that wh uh, where the four. I'm sorry, can it just be, yeah, you have these nice pictures of you. We didn't really go through them all. Are you going to come back to them? Uh, I'll, I'll do them now. Um, I'm saying that this model votes on that. This model suggests that. Um, the, the, here I'm re this repeating. This model referring to the one I'm uh, about to present. The paper. This paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. What they I'm argued present. the following. Is that right? Um, I would say there's, their results suggest the following. Well, yeah. I like you're, you're going to. Okay, go ahead. Just that they they approach this task. They they trained this network to be good at classifying static images. Just having an image flash and, and classify it from that. Um, and it suggests pretty strongly, as I'll get into, um, or fairly strongly, that it's really doing quite something quite similar to the cortex, uh, to the visual hierarchy, uh, to the first the two B1, B2, B4, IT. Um, but, but here, this is just where I'm disclaiming that they haven't even attempted to solve other things like video or, or sensory motor 
object recognition or anything like that. And so there's no there's there's no claim at all that this network is doing it all right. There's tons that it's missing. Uh, and in some ways, that's what why he's forming a lab to try to attack these other problems. But we know, we know, for example, it's interesting to say, is it approximate computation, right? Uh, we know that there's dramatic differences in, between a CNN and the cortex. If you just look at, you know, the number of levels in a CNN that you have to. That's do. that's one of my main points I'm making. Okay. Here. This okay. is four layers. Uh, okay, four, four so layers. they're going to introduce something that's different than what we normally think about. Is that right? I mean, we don't normally think about a CNN. It's it is it's it's different in the sense that they. Yes. So uh, is, I'll is, talk is about there, okay, well, I'm just trying to get ahead of this. It is a CNN, but it's they were careful in how they how they set it up. They gave, gave it skip level connections or level uh -huh. skipping, whatever. Uh -huh. um, okay, so they're trying to show that actually it can be done in like a four level yeah. hierarchy. Uh, and most people don't think about it that way. So um, that's part of their, what their paper is trying to propose. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so. Do they say in the paper anything at all about the neuron model, or is that even a part, a part of this? They're, they're just simple. Um, per, okay, so they don't make an argument. You you the second part of your graph there. You need the NN units by the single quantum problem. That's not really an issue of this paper. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, that was that was not necessary for this presentation, other than that I wanted to give it more okay. pneumatic context. Yeah. Yeah. Marcus, yeah. Uh, maybe a question I had, but this paper is from 2000. 14. Yeah. And you have more recent evidence after this paper confirming this hypothesis or denying this hypothesis? Uh, one thing to keep in mind, neuroscience time moves much more slowly than, um, than machine learning time. Uh, otherwise, they did some follow-up studies on this. But the point is, this isn't just a theory paper. This paper has experimental results. Right. Uh, and so it's, yeah. It, the same authors have uh, newer Yeah, so so they have they have replicated this on newer uh, in two thousand sixteen. The same author has replicated replicated it again with the different training data set, uh, and I, th I think different neural recordings, but I can't say yeah, different neural recordings. Uh, so um, I, I'm going to present like the details of their model. Um, and what I'm gonna build up to is that um, after they've trained this model, um, they then are able to show an image to a macaque monkey um, and show that same image to a network. And they're able to um, predict single unit responses in the macaque's cortex um, using just linear combinations of units from up here. Um, so things to things to point out is the model never encounters the neural data. These are two separate worlds. The, mo the model's just learning to recognize objects, um, and the neural data is over here. Um, you would not expect single units to match single units. Uh, at, like why not? I thought that was the point you were making. They were making. No, no, the, the, they're not doing that. They're they, doing the, the overall computation. Just, they're not doing the y, the x. Well, axis. well, so suppose, um, suppose, um, but no, but you said the responses. I thought the whole point of it was the showing res cellular response properties that match. No, the 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 thing is, okay. The, let's say my IT is a, is my model. Of, let's say let's say we're comparing my IT to your IT. Uh, you wouldn't expect single units to have the same tunings. You would expect though to be able to trend to maybe do linear combinations of like 30 of your particular neurons could predict one of mine. Uh, and the point is the mapping that's, between that's these- not, That's not clear. The mapping between two- That's not clear to me at all. I mean, one of the, uh, uh, I think some of the foundations of, you know, neuroscience is when they look at these response properties themselves, they expect to see the similar response property in different animals. You know, in the, you know, take two macaque monkeys. They don't expect one macaque monkey. They, they expect to see the similar response, similar response property. They don't expect to say, oh, I can find the equivalent of doing a linear combination of this animal to get to that animal. I, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's how they thought about it. Um, uh, but if you think about like IT, if there's a, a, you know, Bill Clinton neuron in one monkey, and this other monkey's never been exposed to Bill Clinton. Well, it's never been exposed to it, but yeah. we've all been exposed to Bill Clinton, so that we 
we would be it would be surprising that <laughs> well maybe less for a bit sense of right so in general the general thinking I think would be that neurosciences would expect to see still. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying that's what they expect. So this model suggests um, an interesting explanation of what IT is doing. And it's not having a Bill Clinton neuron. Uh, it is doing something a little different than that. Well, we don't think there are Bill Clinton neurons either. Right, right. We think there are neurons that participate in sparse distributed representations uh, for Bill Clinton. And you might think one of those cells responds to Bill Clinton, but it also responds to other things too. So uh, just be careful that you know, we don't think there's Bill Clinton neuron either. Uh, you don't believe in grammar themselves, so. Right. Yeah. So okay, the their result is and their result is that um, a linear combination of some of these units, um, every every monkey unit they observed, or most of the monkey units they observed, can be mapped onto uh, linear combinations. Isn't that, isn't that as simple as saying if both the the neural network and the monkey can recognize this image and classify it? Is that not the same as saying I can get a linear combination of the units in the upper layer? That, that are That's equivalent? a valid question, and they address that. Um, they, they show that um, a network that, they show that um, the, the correct category, the correct label, the classification, if they just train a classifier on that and predict neural responses, it does really badly. Uh, it, it, just, just knowing that this, that the photos of Bill Clinton is going to do a really poor job of predicting the neural responses. So, what, what does predict neural responses? So this, uh, okay. Uh, here's one thing that I had, I had to realize over time. Um, often, when you see a, top, a neural network, the top layer is a set of labels. Um, these are not labels. These yeah. are. Th this is a convolutional layer. Uh, yeah. So. Um, but but the, the the classifier the labels that go on top look at these units right so some combination of these units would yeah could be so yeah here like I think I should talk about the training and testing what they trained on and what they tested on because it's a little bit different than what you normally expect in supervised learning uh, and I think that there is a little bit of a barrier right now in telling it that across uh, so what they trained on first of all. Um, an this, is the, this is the neural network. Yes. Okay. Yes. What they trained the neural network on is they had this set of image categories like um, bodies, buildings, musical instruments, shoes, a, a few others, nine total that they trained on. Um, and um, and in the training data, they like rotated these uh, to various orientations and put them on different random backgrounds. Uh, and basically, they tried to make the vision problem harder than just Right, just, uh, just well, making it a little harder, and um, these are labeled data points. Uh, yes, yes, um, and so they train the top layer on this model um, to support linear classification of these nine categories, uh, which is equivalent. This is a little wonky, but you could think of it as putting like a fifth layer up here temporarily. With a, with a temporary unit for each category and then back propagating it and then just like stripping off that top layer. And then that last part, stripping off the top layer is interesting um, because during testing, they now use a different set of categories. Uh, oh. They don't, they're not testing whether the network can recognize these categories. They give it a whole new data set, a whole, whole new set of backgrounds um, uh, all, all sorts of things. They even render it in different software. And um, and now um, they train kind of a new temporary top layer, but just that top layer. They, they, train, they train this new one to linear classify these new objects like animals, boats, cars, chairs, and fruits. So this is transfer learning, or like testing yeah. for the idea of transfer learning in uh, deep conversation. Is that really the right term for it, transfer learning? Or is it, are you just sort of learning the right sort of basis set for classifying things? I mean, well, I mean that, that's that, kind that, of the that, same thing. I think transfer learning sounds like, oh, I'm really smart somehow. I don't know what, I don't know what the technical term for definition is. It, it basically says you train the lower levels to some level and then use them in it. I got it. I understand. But that to me sounds a little odd to call it transfer learning. Maybe that is the right. technical term. Right. But transfer learning to me, and I don't, I don't know the machine learning definition of transfer learning. 
But if I think about transfer learning, you might say like, hey, I, I have this idea that, you know, uh, They're talking that, about transfer uh, coffee shops learning. are similar to bakeries sure. and I can now, or my kitchen is similar to, I don't know, whatever, or startup companies are similar to research labs. And I take some knowledge about some domain and it's much more deeper than just like, you know, it's like, right. we yeah. think about yeah. unfortunately like, in machine learning, it's, it's, um, that's what they're that the equivalent and, of that. Uh, I mean, so and sometimes they can also fine tune the lower levels, but it's basically using one network to train. Yeah, okay. so I mean, like, no one would be surprised in the first level of these layers of these networks that you have oh basic features that you describe you describe in the world. You know, right. so, the, the, a trivial sort of transfer learning. The, the argument why it's, it's worth using the term is simply that that is the most complex thing that these networks can do, build the representations in that third layer. And so if you were to talk about transfer learning at all in these networks, then you would talk about it in the context of the highest level. Okay, well, I'm trying to just uh, knock it off its pedestal. Right, right. yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I fully agree. Yeah, you know, you know, so know, it's, it's, it's just an extended version of what's going on in the first level of the network. Um, and it's not really too surprising to me um, that that would happen, but um, okay. you have model one, model two, model three. Yeah, I haven't gotten into the okay. details on the model yet. I was going to do that, but I, I thought this was one good quick question yeah. on the animal data. Uh, you said these are macaque recordings. Um, one, are these Electron recordings, uh, do we use the LFPs? Or are these sound signals or are these single cell recordings? And then, so do they do spike sorting? They're, they're single unit record, they're, they're predicting single unit responses. Right, but the single unit is an LFP. Like an in intracortical. Is it, is it LFP or an actual or spikes it, from single cells? Right, or is it single cell? Why right? do they do spike sorting? I guess it works. Well, or are they clamping on the domain? would seem unlikely, right? Because we wouldn't get enough data. I don't know. Yeah, my guess is they're doing spike sorting. It seems yeah, 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 yeah. I think they're probably uh, like and the second question probes. is, uh, I presume that this also means that these monkeys are head fixed and have a fixation node. Is that correct? They are, yes, they, they're, fi they're, fix they're fixating on a dot. They don't need to be head fixed, do they? Just have to fixation. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about the head fixed part, but they're, they're awake. Fixated on a dot. I'm right. assuming they're fixated on a dot. They flash an image, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's it. And yeah, okay. and, the, and and they only flash the images. They only flash the image for a hundred milliseconds. Yeah, so, so it's not time to get right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this paper suggests if if you um if you want to describe what is the functional role of IT uh, in the view of this um is uh, at least in this model what it does is it encodes the input and a basis that is really useful for, rec for recognition. Uh, uh, so the idea that IT encodes object identity is not quite right. Uh, the idea, instead, IT encodes the input in a really useful way that makes, that makes classification easy. That's why you can classify an object identity from IT recordings, but that's not suggesting that that's particularly what it's doing. So now I can talk about the, uh, the model a little bit in more detail. And, and um, I've translated this into a picture that's a little more neuroscience-y or a little bit more, um, this is kind of the machine learning version of it. This is the equivalent version of it where, where I talk about cortical columns and such. Um, so like, I'll talk about this briefly. Uh, here I'm showing like the image basically and um, and each of these is e each of these is the same um, filter is being applied to different parts of the image, and here a, a cortical column, uh, which they never they don't use the word cortical column in here. I, this is me introducing interpretation here. Uh, <coughs> consists of here I'm just saying standard mapping of CNNs onto cortical columns. Uh, the, the idea that um, every one of these has like has these groups of units. Um, but this has the additional change that, um, that the whole thing is multiple parallel models. Uh, and now I'll explain that. Uh, I was just introducing that side of the board. Uh, so 
this model can, is simulating the idea of, um, of level skipping, uh, the idea that sometimes, well, the, the observation that V1 will skip levels, V2, everything will, will skip. And some, sometimes it goes through multiple levels of processing uh, before it reaches IT. So the way they simulate all that is they have a set of these models that are trained separately. These, kind of, these smaller convolutional neural networks. Uh, here's a two layer network. Here's a three layer network. Here's a one, <coughs> one layer network. <coughs> and um, so they, they actually train these separately. Uh, they, don't, they don't do one enormous training uh, uh, stage. They don't train the whole network at once. They, they use a, a, a strategy some people might know about, but it's, um, it's called boosting. Uh, uh, so, so boosting and like if you open a machine learning textbook, it has a certain meaning involving uh, training parallel models, tra training an ensemble of models. Uh, and it, I'm talking about it briefly just because I think we might come back to, we might use something like this when we uh, start training parallel models. Uh, it's, it's a useful idea. Uh, the idea, like the briefly, what they do is they train this network. Um, and it performs better on some examples and worse on others. Are you saying they're classifying the second layer? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah, so they, cla they classify the second layer. They train this. Um, it, do it does a really good job at classifying some examples. It does a poor job of, it, of classifying others. Um, so when they train this next one, they weight the examples. Uh, they, they make it, they, they can reward the network a little bit more for, um, for being able to recognize those objects that this one was bad at recognizing. Um, and they proceed to basically train every model so that it, it gives preference to the, um, to the examples that the previous ones weren't, weren't doing such a good job on. Uh, and so this is a- So it sort of comes down to this is then some sort of a mixture of models. Or yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a standard way of doing mixture of experts. Uh, and it's generally referred to in machine learning as a Okay, but the thing about it is a mixture of models, and you're basically saying divide them up as yeah. best you can. Yeah, and um, and by giving these different depths, uh, it's 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 like multiple parallel models being trained on the same input. Uh, that's that's a little bit different than when we talk about multiple parallel models. We're often talking about different input. Uh, so, yeah, multiple parallel same, trained on same input, uh, and they simulate this. Um, this is kind of their stand-in for this. This is um, how they're doing level skipping. They they just think of it as like this is a two-layer network. This is a three-layer network. This is a one-layer network. And then they all feed into a fourth layer that takes it all in. And um, and this is also trained separately. Uh, they, so did they just concatenate all these? Yes. Uh, the, the, so you they, have these huge vector coming into the fourth. Layer. Yes. The, the fourth. So the fourth layer, like it doesn't even know that it's receiving a. a, a Neural network, but it might be receiving. It might think it's receiving an image or something like that, and um, they're training it using the typical way of training a one-layer network. Um, so they had to go through a process to arrive on this, to arrive at this, and um, and it's just an interesting to, to come back to the. Can the, you explain why you draw those with three little squares in each of the levels? The, so yes, each of these are um, so these are convolutional layers. So each one, of, each one of these is. A filter or a feature map, uh, it, where like okay. one point on it says that like there is a um, there is an edge at this part of the image. There is an edge at this part of the image, and as you go up, they well, kind of. So I, excuse my ignorance about this, but I can say okay, you have a feature map, then you have a convolutional level layer. Why is there more than that? Is there like multiple feature maps? What, why do you show us three there? I'm so th th three means this, th like this is a model, this model, and I'm just doing three by default everywhere. It might be like 42. That's 42 features uh, that it's, it's, it's saying like, um, here's where this feature is in the image. Here's where another one is. Here's where another one is. Um, now the parallel models, well, um, parallel models could all just be identical types of models trained differently, um, but they also do experiment with different hyperparameters. They're like simulating the idea that, um, some neurons are different <coughs> than others. Uh, so some they do um, 
their, their activation thresholds are different. Uh, they're, they're, they, they vary hyperparameters across these as well. Um, Could I ask yeah. one other question? Uh, in that boosting, when you were talking about, you know, you have the first one that has some examples that it doesn't work well with, and then you kind of train the other one up to fix the correction. There. Is that successive refinement, or do you kind of rotate things around so that everything's not just referenced to the first one and correcting all the deficiencies? Um, it's, you know, in other words, if I if I basically said, okay, this thing, <clears throat> I can divide my training example up into set A and B. A, this thing does really well, and B is very bad. Now I just take B and feed it. And no, it's always right. success. No, it waits all of them. It, uh, three is considering what, how did one do on it? How did two do on it? Right. You're successfully successively updating a set of how you're weighting the examples. Okay, so we get around to you know, there's no one that has more specificity than the other one. The fact that you happen to start with model one is, is not important. I would say, I, 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 my guess here is I think model one is kind of the special one that gave equal weight to every example. Okay. Okay. No, I, I'm just kind of curious. Are there here. multiple models that have the same number of layers? Like you show model two and model n, both starting three. Yes there, yes, there are multiple. The paper didn't get into details about exactly how many of these there were. Do you, but you get a stats for how many of those there were? No. No, that like this was one one complaint for this paper was there were basic details about the model that I they just I mean didn't. that seems like I'm trying to map that out the neuroscience but I can't even imagine that map out the neuroscience um, that dimension there um, uh, sort of uh, I mean like di wow. different different groups of mini columns uh, okay think of think of multiple cortical columns processing the same patch. Like you might have, you mentioned in S1, you could have the slowly adapting and the rapidly adapting uh, cortical columns processing the same patch, but different different types of sensors. In, but they were in the in the brain, okay, if you want to go that way, say okay, there's different. Uh, well, actually, actually, the way the way just we talked about mouth capsules paper last Friday was that you have a column processing a patch of uh, retina, and in that column, there's overlaid multiple modalities on top. Okay. Right. That's what I should have said. And and so this idea that there's, this is almost like there's multiple brains here. It's it's like, you know, you've got this model one and model two, model three, model n. Uh, I don't really see an equivalent in your cortex. I'm just want, I'm not I, I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm yeah. So I, I guess I'm saying like, let's say a cortical column has 120 mini columns. Maybe 30 of them are one of these. 30 of them are another. 30 are another. Uh, okay. Well, that's made up and, and also that then we should be able to correlate that with model and have to decide the end. If n in this case turns out to be 200, well, it doesn't work. I don't think it is. Yeah, well, if it turns out to be four, maybe it would work. Um, it's also a stretch to make that assumption. Um, there's no biological basis for saying that it's a stretch, but okay. I just want to understand what they've done because they really have multiple models that have different sets of parameters, different sets of everything in some sense. Um, yeah, I mean, they're still all like, you know, perceptron units, but they'll do different kinds of. I'm just saying these models, one through n, are really independent at this point. Yeah. Um, they're independent. They're, of depth, they're, they're independent. They're, yeah, they're, they're complementary, but they're. They're not independent because model n depends. No, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean it that way, but they're, they are multiple models and they're, they're, they're dependent based on their how they're trained. But other than that, they're, they're separate, just they're parallel. Just separate yeah. parallel models. Yes. I think that's a fundamental disconnect between how brains work, but. We can go with it for now. I just said there's a lot of things can be said, like that. My experience has been when people try to make correlations between artificial neural networks in the brain, they get very sloppy about these details. They just hand wave you say, Oh, yeah, it's this, it's like this, and this, is like that. And they don't really think about it carefully. And so I'm, I'm always cautious when people say that. Um, so anyway, I just want to be, I'm not being critical, I'm just pointing out that just to show that. That's like that's a big assumption, and, and how would you? I wouldn't think about the brain looking this way at all. Um, I don't think it is these end models that are in parallel. No, they're at least not this parallel. So this is a very complex setup, um, you know, pretty intricate from a machine learning standpoint. And typically, if you wanted to train a ten-category network to do well, you wouldn't need to do all of this stuff. Did they motivate this? Did they try a simpler system? What like why? Yeah. Why did why this particular complex architecture? Uh, it almost seems to me like they're 
fit into the neural data. So <laughs> you know, they keep trying things until something fits the neural data. Yeah. You know, no, 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 eventually no. something will. No, it's there's there the the only way they're fitting to neural data is that they're constraining this to be four. Why is it? Yeah, no, no, that's in the inner no, loop. But, but in the outer loop, when you think about them trying to do this paper, yeah. they're going to keep trying different things until they get something that fits well, the neural no, data. No, no, wait, wait, let's talk about the paper. Okay. 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 What motivated this design? Yeah. yeah, this is this is not motivated by neuroscience. No, but Adabu has been well established as a super awesome. Adaptive. Yeah, but nowadays you don't need to do any of that. Uh, you don't need to do this complex setup to do a 10 category classification. It's much simpler than that. And so they did this specifically to get this result. Right? That's clear. Okay, okay. this was this paper was in 2014. Uh, things have, uh, they, they probably have simpler models now, but this is the best I can present. Yeah, I found that in 2014. All the way. Okay. Like, Adaboos came out in. Well, Adaboos is really old. Yeah. Adaboos is very 2004 or something. Yeah. Or even earlier. But in kind so, of competition, like 2014. Uh, first of all. Old. So, so anyway, I, I don't think the assessment that they um, that they trained this until it was matching the neural data is right. Uh, that that that's one the the first figure on this paper. Um, they compare uh, a bunch of different models uh, where they um, where the on the bottom is their category ca categorization performance so the the test performance on this um, and on the y-axis they check how much of the uh, variance can they explain in, in single units and um, and first they went with simple models simple three layer models uh, this this one on the left is just single ones of these, uh, at, where they just they just take these, and um, and they find this general trend that uh, the better the network performs on this categorization, uh, the better it is, the better the network is for explaining for predicting neural activity. Uh, and I want to step back and just re repeat, like it's real, it's interesting to keep in mind. Um, this explained variance is gets up to around thirty percent for the for their first three layer ones. Um, then they went on to create this more um, this more adventurous model, um, and they found that they can explain fifty percent of variance uh, with it. And and they got there simply by trying to improve the performance on it. Uh, and and I would say the only way that they um, tried to make it match neural data was by adding level skipping. Uh, so the the kind of the, even the title of the paper, well, kind of, the title of the paper is essentially implying that um, all you have to do, well, they're implying that they were trying to make a four layer network perform really, perform object recognition really well. Uh, and and when I say perform it really well, it's this it's this interesting kind of it where what you're really trying to do is train an IT that has a really useful basis for object recognition, uh, and and that's that's what they're trying to train the, the network to do. That was the motivation, and it just so happened that that also caused it to be able to predict neural data. It's a, you know I, I it's a, I don't find this result surprising at all. I, I guess I'm starting with that. It's like if you've got two systems that can both solve this this uh, object classification problem, and at some point, right before you do the classification, they're going to have some common basis set. It's like how could it not? And if it, it doesn't matter any of the details underneath it, how you got there, it, it, that's almost like a given. It's going to have to do that. Um, and so, and it's not even like you know direct cell. It's, it's some linear combination of these cells that produces the same results. It's like, how could it not be that way? Am I, am I missing something? Yeah, I kind of feel similarly too, because it's, if you, you know, if we say, you know, if IT is going to solve this problem, there's going to be some simple way to take the ID representation and classify it. Let's say a linear classification. And the definition of this classifying is you can take a linear classification of this, uh, a linear combination of these outputs and classify the, 
And so you right. should be able to and find so you should be able to easily find a linear no, correspondent. No, no, yeah, you, because yeah, no, that doesn't no, that doesn't work. You can't go from a complicated representation to category back to complicated representation. No, it's just no. It, no, if you have two things where linear combinations of them can classify the same data set, you can find a linear combination of those two that map. Yeah. It's trivial. Yeah. That's so it's, it yeah. seems trivial to me too. I don't think, okay, I'm not going to be able to, in this mo moment, figure that out, but that, that strikes me. I think it has to be. I mean, from my point, it has to be. It's like, if it works, mm -hmm. then how could it not be that way? It's great to use linear combinations. Of it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. It, it just matters. You've got two, the, the two systems. I think it's simpler than linear combinations, but linear combinations is sufficient. Oh, okay. Somewhere. I don't know if it also helps, but don't they also show that like the third layer is predictive of like V4? Yes. I wouldn't be surprised about that either. I guess I guess it's like, what were they expecting it to do? I mean, what you're doing is you're taking the, the brain solves a much more complex problem. It solves a sensory motor learning problem about these objects. But if you don't, if you just give it a flash inference, it can't use any of that. System at that point in time, as you point out, doesn't do moving things, rotating objects, it doesn't understand how objects change over time, and so on. Um, so, uh, it, what you're going to see is sort of these extracted features that, that because it, it can solve the problem at these, you know, these level levels, you're going to get something similar. Right? It's, it's not surprising me. In the same way, at the first level, you're going to find similar type of features as V1. It's not, it's not surprising either. Do, do they make a claim that this four level network? Uh, does the same job accuracy wise, whatnot, of much larger networks? No. No. Okay. I mean, maybe the, the point here is um, that, like, in addition to the sort of deeply convolved data that you're going to get, what was all, you also get some input data that is way less convolved, right? Where you get like a full, you know, projection after one convolution step in layer one, and you, you like go straight up. Yeah. And so you have a mix of um, sort of uh, some detail. You have a higher level detail and lower level detail that is relevant to the classification effort. Right? Um, and one might intuitively you know, expect that. Uh, at least the model shows that that is useful. And maybe then the entire extent of that mapping to biology is that, well, yes, in biology, there's also, you know, level skipping and uh, it's not a strictly hierarchical organization. Yeah. So higher order areas also have access to low level information, yeah. at least to a certain extent. And so and we know that maybe, so. maybe that is the extent of what is really being shown here. That I, both I, these systems yeah. are working on a, on a basis of, you know, Partial processing. Yeah. 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 Yes, but I want to add or just put an extra emphasis on the 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 easy explanation that IT is representing inputs in a basis that makes it easy to linearly separate uh, things, even even novel objects, even objects that you've never seen before. Uh, this, I think, this suggests that that's a pretty good at interpretation of what IT is doing, or at least part of what IT is doing. Yeah, but you don't need all of this complicated stuff to uh, make that assertion, I think. I mean, the assertion that you have, I mean, that IT represents uh, image information in a way that you can easily classify them, classify objects, even objects you haven't seen before. Okay. I mean that it seems like you can test that hypothesis independent of any of this. So, right. so uh, in, 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 in case work? in case it's not clear, like any old network will work. I'm sorry. You're saying any old network will work? No, no, I'm not network saying any old network will work. Okay. Uh, I didn't say that. But the the mixture models work. Yeah. Pretty sure I saw my previous paper presentation that showed similar results, but it wasn't. Okay, so so it's the thing I I can't say for sure is whether people have figured out how to. Um, how to use one single back propagation iteration, just train this all at once so that it is one model. Uh, I think I would expect you to have to add level skipping. So, but it may be the case that, um, that you can train this without doing the complicated setup of a mixture. 
right. uh, which is basically to say back propagation can discover the solution on its own. You don't need to do it manually. Yeah, and another question is, did they try to have uh, boosting with several models but with the same number of layers? I mean, without that speaking? Because, I mean, it's difficult now to understand the impact of having multiple models and using their competence together to get these different results. I, I'm or, not sure if they did the yeah, solution. Uh, for, for me, I think, I mean, maybe that, you know, the uh, major impact on the performance of the model is because you use, you know, an ensemble of models, not because you use let us keep going also in that direction. Of, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not really clear to me the level skipping is really helpful. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we have a theory why the, what, a lot of what's going on with level skipping too is that these, the second, you know, a lot of, all these layers are capable of recognizing complete objects. And they, and, you know, the other thing you go back, like what cells are they recording from here? If you go classically, look how people record from cells in the cortex. Um, um, the vast majority, I want to say vast majority, more than 50% of the cells do not, are not, they don't have any correlation to the, they don't see this correlation to the inputs, so they're ignored. Right? And so they're not looking at all the cell responses here. I guarantee you, they're looking at only the ones that seem to respond to these kind of inputs. Right. And, um, and so, I mean, the whole model is, is really just, the way you're thinking about it in our world is totally different than this. And so you're, you're basically sort of taking what the brain really doing, which is basically complete modeling in every cortical column and throwing away most of that um, and only recording, looking for the cells that are, are representing sort of features and not, not the, Cooling layer. Um, it just is really, really. If you don't know that stuff, it's really easy to misinterpret these things. It's just, you know, I mean, again, what cells are they looking at? They say this correlation, you know, this is the Hubble and Beetle stuff. Over 50% of the cells of the Hubble and Beetle could measure from the ignored because they didn't seem to correlate with the changing input. Well, I think, uh, in the object. Let me make a assertion. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Let me, let me, I need to draw it out. Maybe can I, uh, uh, I'll see. Yeah, you can. You can I, maybe this is the least sure. relevant part of it. And it might or might not help here. But, you know, suppose you have some really complex system here. Let's call it a CNN. Um, and then you have a linear system here that with a set of weights that can then classify some data set. And it does a good job of that. You have some other complex system, let's call it the monkey. And you have another set of weights that can classify the same data set well. Okay, so the output of both of these systems classify data set may well. Just with these circles here. You, you uh, this is the linear system, so this might be okay, okay, kind of got it, categories. Yeah, yeah. Right, category stuff. This is the so I'm just, this is how they kind of yeah. thing set up. I think if you have this, it's necessarily the case that you can find a linear combination of this that will predict this. You can just go through and invert the uh, matrix. That's why I, I think, I think I anything agree. anything here will work. That it doesn't matter what this is. My as long as this does well here. Yeah. And as long as this does well here in this setup, this can predict this. That's my intuition yeah. as well. I don't, I, can't, I don't know how to prove it. That's my intuition. I can see it going either way. You're probably right. I just, in this moment, I can't figure it out. It's, it's almost hard so, to imagine it's an option. Option. Yeah. I, if it's If these are linear systems, simple linear systems. Yeah. 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 And, and in that case, the B3 thing, the B, sorry, the, sorry, the B4 result down here would still would be a little interesting. Yeah, that makes it, that's a little more. That doesn't fit that model. That's a little more surprising. But maybe so even there, it, I'm it might surprise by that. Actually. So the, the one detail I didn't throw in here is like this is the best people have ever. This is the new gold standard for modeling IT and neurons. It used to be people, like I know you're not get. Uh, I know sometimes neuroscientists say that V1 is well understood and that <laughs> we can model the inputs pretty well. Um, and I know that that's not true. It in, depends in, in on the neuroscience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I know that like only by some approximation is that kind of true of some neurons. Um, yes. So, like, like that's like a 80 to 90% false statement. Okay. Uh, so this this statement will not impress you then, 
but, uh, <laughs> but we have now reached that level for IT. Uh, this paper got us to that level for IT. Where for for we're static um, Yes, static images, yes. Uh, and so it's just like, this isn't just a random it's just, paper that me, matches it's, those it's results. Only misleading because it just, it's reinforcing bad behavior on the, it, it, if you're trying, <laughs> if you're trying to argue that we understand being one is this, this class, you know, this uh, feature extractor, and now we're, now we're kind of saying, no, look, we understand it V2 and V4 too. Excuse me, it's a total BS. These systems are super complicated. And, and we know that, you know that. And we now know that they're doing these really complicated things using reference frames and, and cooling and so on. Um, and their sensory motor system. So um, we, can't, we can't fool ourselves into thinking this is somehow capturing what's going on in the brain. I think it's a separate question to say, if this is the way people want to build artificial neural networks, what can we take from the brain to make them better? But I don't think this is any evidence that this is how the brain works at all. Um, it's just showing, I think it's what Subutai just said. It's just showing that you minimize the problem to being pattern classifiers of a certain type and they can both work at classifying the pattern they're going to have some correlation at this level. And yeah, that's me. I'll go for that. Totally agree with that. And that's really interesting that that's what IT might be doing. I don't think, we don't, do you believe that? Uh, uh, you worked here the last three years, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you worked on this theory. We know that these are sensory motor systems with doing pooling and reference frames. That is not a, a guess we're going to abandon. We know that's true. I know it's I true. I think we're looking at like different approximations of some complex thing. We're looking at it from different angles and seeing from this one maybe strange angle of flashing images on the retina. But to say that's what IG does, it's totally wrong. Okay, yeah. That's yeah, not what IG does. I, 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 I think that is true. Uh, I would be very surprised if that was not true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. In that case, it's not you're not really saying what they're doing is not, they're not trying to explain how IT and V4 works. What they're trying to have is a statistical model that it can explain the variance of responses they get. And a lot of times in neuroscience, they will have generalized linear models or other PCA based models that explain okay. the variance of responses. I'm going to prove you wrong. Okay, but but this this is a different way that can explain a bigger variance than the other models. Suppose the top layer of this network. Is a classification. It, this is this is is it a coffee cup? This is is it a marker? Suppose the top layer of this is the IT classification. Uh, so, sorry, it's the suppose it's this. Suppose it's this big thing coded into a big basis. I'm sorry. In these systems, um, when you say, it, is there a single neuron that's active and it says this is a coffee cup? Another neuron that says it's active, but it's you know. Um, this, no, no. no. You'll have distributed representation. Okay, and those distributed, are they like sparse distributed representation? No, like they'll be dense. Small. What's that? They'll be dense. They'll Pretty be, dense. If, if they're using values, it'd be like 50%. Okay. So the, I don't think this is true. Because if, it, like, the, the illustrative example is suppose you have, you do, suppose you do have the single units uh, here, what, then, what, then it then what, just identity. Single units on this example? Sorry, uh, that's what I was just saying. No, that, uh, it is true in that case. Uh, so, th so then, yes, identity can map from here to here. Yes, um, and you'll be able to do the. So now you're saying you can now predict from here what these responses will be. Yeah, you can't predict from cell identity what the the you can't. But you're saying from, it's a, some linear combination, though, right? It's yeah. So identity, identity is something. So, so you have to. Uh, this logic. You're is not going to have the same cell responses. You're, you're going to have some linear combination. You're going to build a linear combination over here, right? You can't predict the top layer of this from this in the general case. It's, when we say predicting, we're saying some, it's, it's, it's not like this cell over here is going to have the same response as this cell over here, right? We're saying that there's some linear combination of these cells is going to predict right. individual cells over here. Uh, and I don't see why that wouldn't be true. Right? Because suppose the top layer of this is a one hot encoding of the, of the classification. Oh, what? Oh, one one hot vector, or one hot, uh, where single unit where each you have grandmother cells. Well, I just asked you. You said no. We're not talking about grandmother. Cells. But it could, it could in principle. But this well, is, but that was the point. That was a big difference. It, no, the, the network could learn this if it wanted to. And I'm showing the extreme example. I don't think the entire class at all. That's Nobody my point. Nobody thinks that. But like, well, right. So so now once you introduce that, we're totally in the woods in terms of brain. It's this not like this is not true that you can predict these units from these units in the general case of these. That's like, it's, it can't be, it's not true. 
I there agree. are many cases where it is true, but I think there are many more cases where it's not. So, uh, um, this again just strikes me as a one system. I mean, we know that these layers are so much more complicated. And to say that you know V1 is understood, people have no idea what V1 is. We have a much better idea than what they do. And 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 so we have this whole theory about every column and every layer of what it's doing, and it's much more complicated. So we now we're just looking at sort of you generate a case when you're you've already trained the brain, you're now just flashing the image in front of it. You're only looking at some of the cells because most of the cells don't part, don't fit your model at all. And and how useful is that? I don't know. I just doesn't seem very useful. Um, well, I guess in 2014, from a machine learning perspective, was still, you know, uh, the idea of deep learning was still very interesting. It is a, a concept that you could, you could build, you know, a non -linear, linear representation starting from pixels yeah. and get, you know, higher level, you know, activations of, you know, I, and the responses were complex. That's you know, great, but this idea that somehow all of a sudden we now, it's now we understood V1 and now we're understanding IT, I think it's total nonsense. And that's, yeah. that doesn't nobody's mean. making the claim that well, you just said that. I, I, I just led by saying people make the false claim that that we understand v1 but we understand some portion of v1 kind of i didn't read the statement so i apologize oh. you know so, so if they're making this this claim that somehow these systems are really capturing what's going on right i would just totally disagree they they sort of do make that claim but I they, think it's but, just nonsense they're just finding these correlations and we can maybe disagree about it. They're finding these correlations under this one simple set of things that deep neural networks can do or convolution neural networks can do, which is a tiny subset of what actual brains do. Yeah. Under that small subset, they can find some correlation between these different levels. Well, fine, but that doesn't really claim that anything at all what's really going on in the brain is, is crazy. Um, the question is, is that finding that we're explaining 50%? Of the, of the variance, is that actionable? Like, in what way? Uh, well, that's what is, but you know, this, way, this, right? this kind of chart where you explain the variance of some experimental result is so common in neuroscience. I see it, I've probably seen hundreds of presentations where they do right, this, but this and they do very simple, and they, I, I agree, no, it's not it? actionable, I, yeah, but, but it seems that? to be a big thing in neuroscience for understanding experiments, and I don't understand why. Um, <laughs> People have done this with random networks. Uh, you've you've, yeah, you've, yeah, you've seen it. Random random networks, so uh, it's not against like a real spiking. Exactly. You have these random context. recurrent networks, and you can match these yeah, uh, yeah. the variants of the yeah, really? system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a yeah. cosine talk, I think. Yeah. People from physics are very fun. The colors. What is this random selection? So. Yeah, I want to say blue and red, but it might be green, so I don't want to think. <laughs> yeah, so this is, there are three colors. Yeah, sorry. Three colors, right. so, so, yeah, this paper didn't pay attention <laughs> to colorblind people and their vision people. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's got colorblindness. A so. <laughs> <laughs> vision lamp just released a paper. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Lucas. They didn't, they didn't really pay attention. You see all the dots in the lower right hand corner? You can see the dots, but not the So, so, to, so this pretty much addresses That's the question. Just cool. so, we, <laughs> so, here's what happens when you generate, a, take a random network and try to linearly classify objects from it. Uh, right. And so, that they did address that point, yeah, I'm sure. Random, random I think so, yeah. Okay. And, and then, they they, then they train a linear classifier on the top of it. Um, so, uh, uh, so the random one is a random linear system. Did you say uh, random uh, CNN? Random, system? random CNN. CNN. Okay. Yeah. Uh, almost positive of that. I didn't focus very much on that detail. Um, so, like, keep in mind, like this. Um, they had sort of a two-part training thing where one type of training they were doing was like building a model like this and seeing how it does. And the second thing they were doing is trying a bunch of different arrangements of these models, having some levels skipping, having none, have different kind of tooling here and there. And that second kind of training was like an outer loop of, they weren't using back propagation for that outer loop. They were just like, it was almost more like a genetic algorithm. Like, how's this do? How does that Based do? How on does what? this do? How could they do this? this uh, so the, the orange one, the orange one is the special case where they 
they did base it on its neural predict uh, predictiveness. It's like it's well, like a super type of warning. Yeah. No, but only these orange dots are that. Yeah. It, they, so they were just saying, like, in, somewhat interestingly, if we just aim for IT uh, uh, bidding, we also improve our perform the categorization performance. Uh, that's not their main result, okay. though. That's uh, you can tell that they anticipated a lot of feedback. They did the random thing. They did the 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 case where they do optimize for it and the case where they don't. In this, you don't show it. You call that level skipping, but you don't show any model skipping layer one. Uh, Going right to layer two, or well, that would be the same as just starting here. I see, yeah. and yeah, from there, so, angle, that would be the same. But as is there, like so, when I think about the brain, I think about you know, V1 is these there's only a certain area of the retina I can get input from. Um, is that not true here? If I if in your thing labeled model three, there are the, the individual uh units in these model three thing, are they looking at the entire retina? Yeah, they are. Yeah, okay, so that's calling it. That layer is, it's not really the guy. It's not a level in the whole cortex. It, you got individual units. I'm waiting for the, for the subscription. Uh, take that image. No? Because, well, just because it's convolutional. Convolutional is it's, it's mapped out like this. No, but I'm not talking no, about that. No, no, but no. each unit is only looking at a three by three or five by right. five. Pack. Oh, so that's not true. So, so I mean, in but that has nothing to do with that. Was, that would be, that's true of every single model. Yeah. Yeah, no, but in the brain, if I look at the, the in V2 neurons and the V, Four neurons get direct input from the retina, and, yeah. and in addition to the other computer models, uh, but not from the entire retina. Right? Well, they get they, 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 they have a much wider get a larger numbers. patch. Oh yeah, patch. It's a, it's, it'll go up by a factor four by a factor sixteen. So wait, wait, sorry, you, you're talking about V one right now? V two. No. V oh, well, V two does get a larger patch because of. No, no. What, what uh, I think what Jeff's saying oh, is that you could have a, a layer here saying. which has much bigger filters. This, that no, would no, match. this is a good point. Yeah. Okay, I don't. Okay. Um, so that's if I thought of this, I would have said, "Oh, I'm going to level skip." I would have that little rectangle showing up in second. Now the thing that there. their their model does include that possibility because they're using different like pooling parameters for each of these. So this could very well have a large kernel. Could or how do they know? It just it learns. It sounds like they didn't give these details. They didn't give the, these details. They didn't even tell me whether this was actually one by one. Like this, like I don't actually know if the top layer of this is a uh, if the if the convolutional has um has gone up to a feature map of size one. I don't think the paper says anywhere. It's a really basic fact. But anyway, uh, I mean, it's almost like if you don't have a one level system that recognizes something, um, uh, it's almost impossible to do that. If that if those units are only looking at a small part of the image. Yeah. Um, no, they, fair point. Uh, they and they probably considered this question. Uh, that's they, they probably decided our one layer network should have larger kernels. That's the best yeah. I can tell. So, just to remind for everybody in the room here, if I were to look at um, a column in V2, um, it gets direct input from the retina, uh, which is wider through the town, let's so call it direct, which is much wider than the input that's going into V1. But it also got input from V1, but those are not. Identical. They're processed. They're two separate channels. Are processed differently. So it's like it's getting it's getting both. It's got two very different types of input: the processed input from the one and the unprocessed input from the retina. It's not like they're just two separate inputs are converting together. They're separate pathways, um, processed differently, sorting different neurons and so on. So it's it's much more complicated than than all this. But just just to remind ourselves what's going on there. Like the yeah, well, yes. And so there's the direct cortical portal connection from V1 to V2, but there's also and there's also retinal to thalamic connection to V1 to V2, and there's also V1 to thalamic to V2 connections. Right. Uh, it's really complicated, and it's not just complicated like oh, but well, we can just ignore the complication. There are these these are meaningful differences in here, and it's it's doing something much more. Oh, it's not a small well, I about, about yeah, yeah. well, we have the whole voting thing going on. Like, we have a lot more detail what's going on here. So uh, that's not saying these models have to have that, but just saying that we can't fool ourselves into thinking this is sort of a map of what we, we propose. Uh, machine learning people would really like that. That's why they think there's no deep neural network. They would like what? They, they would like to think of themselves as nice. I know, but they're, <laughs> it's, they're just missing all the detail. It's so easy to fool yourself. It gives you give the Carlo nodes, 
um, she's he's a deep neuroscientist, and, and uh, she knows all these details. Um, and so I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, details. I just wanted to make sure we were clear. Uh, it just it's worth just echoing. There are four layer convolutional neural networks that yes have involved parallel models but they're four layer convolutional neural networks that um, perform object recognition at levels of certain kind of object recognition at levels comparable to humans um, and so anyway the, the 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 idea that convolutional neural networks always require hundreds of layers to do well isn't true uh, so that's i think that's an interesting walk away from this yep Although I'm still a little bit, you know, we talked about the, the, the depth of these these multiple filters under each model. Yeah. I have trouble relating that to the, I, I didn't take, I didn't accept your, you know, the quote explanation of that. I mean, you were paraphrasing them, I think. So, um, but to me, it's still hard to, uh, I'm not sure when you say, oh, look, a four level convolutional neural network can do this. How many of these filters exist there in total? And um, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, it could be hundreds. Well, I know, I have no idea. So all of a sudden, you, you know, the, the, the definition of a four level neural network starts to get a little wonky. <laughs> for, okay, that just means, that would just mean it's wide. That's mean, that would just mean it's a very uh, wide. You could call it wide, you could call it each level has, well, I don't know, it's just hard to even map it on to it anymore. You draw it like this and you have, look, voila, four levels. but. But each of these levels is completely different than what we're doing in, you know, seeing brains. And so it's it's a it's sort of some collapsing of some other very complex structure onto these quote four levels, and, yeah. but it's not really the same at all. I have, a, I have a question regarding the the new model from data they map onto. Um, you say single unit mean responses in macaque IT. Yes. What does that mean? Mean response of the, they showed the, the they showed the image multiple times. Uh, an average the the neural firing rate uh, and that's what they were predicting the neural firing rate yes these images are okay flat. okay keep in mind firing rate when you're averaging is an ambiguous thing uh right because it's an averaging window it doesn't it, it might mean yeah it and it might mean well, that, like that. it might mean that the neuron was actually so let's say um let's let's pick a number i don't know um let's say why can't I think of a good Hertz level? Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay. this right. let's go with 42 Hertz. Oh, a, a, a neuron is firing at 42 Hertz, or at least the mean firing rate is 42 Hertz. Now, does that mean it was actually firing that fast? Or does it mean half the time it was firing at 84 hertz and the other half it didn't fire at all two brief gamma bursts at 90 80 80 yeah. hertz and then it was silent yeah so the firing rate is it's almost not even useful to say firing rate, right right it also it's, seems it's like the image is being flashed for 100 dollars yeah yeah uh a monkey can identify this stuff really fast it's actually faster than humans identify mm -hmm. um and um so it's puzzling to see them do these tasks because you go like, how do they score right? I don't even see the yeah. symbol, and they yeah. already get the two score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 all right, so you flash the image for 100 milliseconds. When do they start measuring their spots to the neuron, and for how long? Uh, they do say this in the paper. I just scrolled on to it. It's like 70 to, it, I know exactly where they say it in the paper, uh, right in this small text right here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 70 to 170 milliseconds. So exactly they're doing for 100 milliseconds. So you're not going to get too many spikes in 100 milliseconds. Um, uh, I don't know. So, you, you know. Uh, it's essentially a spike count in the 100 millisecond window. Yeah. That's probably a better way to think about it. Even if the time. cell was responding at, at uh, 50 hertz, uh, you could get five spikes in there, right? Yeah. Um, that's a really fast response. Um, so you you know a lot of times if you're averaging, you know, I imagine a lot of times you still get one spike or three spikes, right? Or well, but there's lots of trial averages, right? Yeah. So my point again, well, this is another it's just another sort of a thing. We're throwing away that as you point out, or 
you know, it could be like at 50 hertz one time and zero hertz the next time or whatever, right? So, um, uh, it's just another befuddling aspect of it. It's, it's not so simple. What would be a fair uh, intro for activation? Something like this. We know there's been these studies um, that show, uh, especially if you assume that the, the data has to travel up the IT through each level of the hierarchy. So it's not level scale, that there isn't enough time for any of the neurons to spike more than once. And so that is, it's not, a, you're not getting a, a frequency or graded signal at all. It's like more of like our sort of, you know, binary population, population code. code. And, and so that's a very important piece of data. And so it, it, it tells you that in many, many situations, the brain can't use average it can't use rates it just can't now one can say oh yes but maybe we're skipping blah, blah, blah. i don't know but that it just tells you that you know and now what they're trying to do here is they're trying to say well we don't we really don't have enough time to get rates either so we'll average them over many trials and we'll call that the rate mm -hmm. ah. so you're assuming there's some kind of the like the systems are god i, I don't know are they are they're assuming the systems are god it, it has the same stats all the time and has measured. Well, that is also you know contestable, right? I mean, like they they call IT the visual long term memory, so the idea being that representations are you know reasonably stable there uh, compared to let's say prefrontal cortex where working memory representations are changing very quickly. Um, so there might not even be constant over several trials. Um, That's again with static image presentations. Yeah, Video yeah, presentations, exactly. that's not true. But yeah, yeah, of course. And of course, yeah, all of that goes away as soon as you allow to move your eyes, right? Yeah, or or static eyes at the video. Oh yeah, yeah, as soon as it's changing. Yeah. But I mean what I'm interested in is that can be there because I specifically model that using a so the 70 milliseconds. Yeah. So why do you wait for 70 milliseconds? And so because I no, is that what you're saying? The, yeah, that's okay. that's it, right. Okay. Yeah. So the, my cortic model was a so model like accounted for working memory and that is a you know, top down signal before the cortex presumably maintains long term memory representations active over the delay period. And the interesting question was like, what are the time delays on the, on the before? And you might get 70 milliseconds, but the, if you actually are actively maintaining memory or something via, via back projections, then what is the estimated time just from maximal delays alone? Right? Because these, uh, like uh, PC and, and IT, are 38 millimeters apart in the cortical feet in the cox. And so that at like two millimeters per millisecond already gives you like a temporal delay that is quite substantial uh, just for that uh, top down part. And so, in fact, of course, in a real recording like this, you get both because you get the default response, but then a short while later, you also get a couple of top down responses, right? Um, so we don't know if that's playing a role or not. We, well, we don't know that. You could tell that if you uh, like cross the, the, the arterial commissure. Yeah. Uh, so you separated the two brain halves essentially, except for the for the top part. Then you could prove with the stimulus that you showed only on one eye, but not on the other half. And you could prove uh, the the different speeds of the feed forward component that is presumably very fast, as you just pointed out. There's not enough time, but it's a fast feed forward system. And you could disentangle that with the feedback component, which a model like this does not have at all. But of course, is present in a real IT. Um, where you get the crossover from the other brain half, right? Uh, the, the, the other you know, half field on the retina, which tells you the, 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 the ipsilateral data and that influences the contralateral side after a delay of like some 130 milliseconds. So, in our model, we have uh, the voting occurs among columns nearby and far away. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of this can be done with nearby horizontal connections. Uh, I'm not following what you're saying. Uh, I'm not sure I am. Um, and uh, so I just think that's another complication. I mean, it's like we'd say, oh, there's these feedback connections, but we also we believe that there's voting that's going on right in every level, every level. So, um, I don't know, you know, that, you know, for example, in the real brain, if I show, I would argue the following if I'm showing you a, small, a very, very small object, you can small in the visual field, and the animal can recognize it, that's going to be actually recognized down to the lower levels of the cortex. And they would be recognized as objects in the lower level cortex. Um, and then the object representation gets passed up. If I'm showing you a larger one, I would 
expect to see it um, actually if it's a, if it can be roughly recognized very quickly. Typically, that's the case. Then I would expect it being recognized maybe before or even IT directly from uh, at least before from from retinal input. Um, and it just it just be very different dynamics. We can make predictions about how the dynamics can play out on different types of um, things. If, for example, if all these objects are very large in the monkey's uh, visual field, I would expect that actually new one is playing almost no role in the, in the result in the response. It's not even getting it doesn't even have time to participate, um, and it can't really see much. It may be recognizing features, but V two or V four actually recognizing them. Just these are all sort of variations on a theme of, of the different ways you can slice and dice this and think about it. So going back to your first question, um, yeah. how do we? Uh, well, one of the things you said at the beginning, uh, informing us how to bring neuroscience principles to the deep learning networks. Was there a conclusion from this um, that you would rec a recommendation? Uh, I would say this has. Um, pushed me in the direction that yes, we can apply neuroscience principles even just to convolutional neural networks. Uh, we don't have to do any big fundamental overhaul of them, but just like uh, how many can... neuroscience principles? Oh, uh, I got. I guess like for example, sparsity or something, or something okay. that incorporates sparsity. So, so we've been working on that assumption. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I, and I'm. You're saying it makes you feel I'm, more comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think that's useful to share. Okay, right. <laughs> but, but, right. I just want to make sure. <laughs> not to share that I'm comfortable, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and so so I think we I think maybe we just had the Kool Aid. We all believe that already, and we've got some. You know, I guess we've all been working on that assumption. It's not obvious to me that convolutional neural networks can be improved. It's obvious to me that AI can be improved, but the idea um, that like are, are, have they have they already diverged too much? Versus, like that, I think that's. Still... I guess maybe I'm a little confused by that. Uh, and what we're doing right now, right, is all based on that assumption. Is that right? Or is it, are we just, and I'm, right? I'm putting more weight behind that. And uh, I've already thought course. we've reached this super confidence level about that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we did. Um, so this might be considered perhaps a little bit more evidence along those yeah. lines. The second question is interesting. You know, we've talked about the, the next step we might bring into the uh, next neuroscience principle. One of the next ones we might bring in is the sort of the, the active dendrites, which is your second dimension here. And um, that's not clear to me yet how we do that. Um, I don't think, I, I haven't really thought about it much. I don't know if anyone else has thought about it much yet, but it's sort of like a placeholder. Okay, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if this tells us anything about that. Um, I don't think so. Okay. By the way, I should say this way of presenting the paper is really great. I think it just gets at the fundamental issues really quickly and gets into sufficient amount of detail so we can debate these issues yeah. rather than reading, you know, the deep. Yeah, I, if we read the paper, we probably wouldn't get to these issues as quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I thought this is a really yeah. good way. Yeah. Right. I probably would have gotten pissed off reading this paper. Than <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm sure it's a it just it's, a, it's frustrating me. You can tell I'm frustrated here too. It's, it's frustrating me sometimes to, to, to read about this sort of the, the lack of knowledge about neuroscience in these papers, um, papers like this. Um, and they're just oversimplifying tremendously. Uh, that's my it's more my frustration. And that's why I say I know Jim DeCarlo does it. Spent plenty of time talking about it. Now the uh, Dan Yamans is now Stanford, basically making these recurrent and doing yeah. other things to try to make it handle videos, yeah. and that's kind of a whole line of research. That I think oh, look, that may be great. Yeah. It's the question about it, it's sort of well, I guess I find it frustrating about this is that often these kind of results are used to justify paying no attention to neuroscience. They're they're used to justify see we're really doing the same thing in the brain anyway, so let's not pay any more attention to it. Right. Uh, and that's, I think, it's just oh, definitely. Uh, I, I would say leading members of the machine learning community do see results like that. Yeah, I know. No, we're already doing the right thing. I know, I know. And it's frustrating because they're not. And, they're, and, they, and all the reasons we just talked about why that is not true. Um, so, part of our part of that blame is also on like, experimental neuroscientists using paradigms that are just terribly unbiological. Yeah, like this. 
uh, it, it's not <laughs> that's exa you know, it's, classic it's, example of that statement. Yeah, what I mean is not just the Picard paper. What I mean is that the the paradigms that we use to investigate neural responses are entirely unnatural. No oh, way yeah, in nature will a monkey sit still for ten seconds yeah. Yeah, to look at flashes of pictures. Yeah. Right. Right. Nowhere in nature was that visual cortex ever meant to be used that way. I know. Yeah. So I, I always totally, out, totally agree. Yeah, yeah, I always point out vision is essentially a continuous stream of fixations uh, at different points in the world. And we have a theory of what's going on there that you're essentially just, you know, you're as you move from fixation to fixation, you're essentially recognizing a reference frame and a reference frame and figuring out the distance between them and, and so on. Um, but that's normal vision. You know, I, 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 have, I was on a panel once. You were just on the system. I was on a panel once bit recently. It was uh, at the University of Michigan a number of years ago. And um, and uh, I forget who it was. I won't name the scientist because I wouldn't name him, but I can't remember. And anyway, they got up there and you know, and they were talking about like how well we understand vision and this is vision. I said, that's not vision at all. Vision is walking around, your eyes are moving, the change of things, the rate of changing your three to four times a second. You know, it, 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 it's not like this, you know, it's like that's vision, and we have the sense of our world around us. It's not like this, like flash image flash image. It's funny because if you think about like vision that way, there's no correspondence with some sensory cortex. You can't, there's no picture that you can process this way in the same way uh, in auditory cortex as well. So this only works for vision and only on these very special cases. I, I, I know that kind of language from like talking about memory because there's lots of people are, like trying to, like since I've been working a lot on memory and we like keep having to remind ourselves that we have a working memory system not to record what, you know, has been said five seconds ago. Uh, that's not the point of our working memory system, right? Our working memory system is just one more system that helps us stay alive, right? <laughs> so, so ultimately, all the memory is about behavior, uh, and it's not about memory. Even yeah. though we treat it as like a separate system, but we say that vision is about the world, you know, kinds of things that we understand vision to be about. But in practice, of course, it's not. Uh, vision serves the purpose of you know, generating behavior that makes you uh, be alive. Yeah. Um, He's going to love the affordance competition the hypothesis. The book, I think I mean, Florian that, will. You know, we have this model of the world, right? And um, and the model is continuously being updated. In some sense, every thought, every new insight, you're 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 extending your model. You're adding new objects to our the positions of the world, and you're forgetting most of them. So you're you know, I'll remember right now this picture of the board that Marcus drew, and then traditional, I don't remember it all. And uh, right now, I remember where I put my laptop, but right two days now, I don't know where my laptop was right now. And so, anyway, I, I would disagree with a little bit point. It's not always about action, it's about building this model, and the model allows you to act. So, you don't always have to act, right? You can build this model. I can think I could sit here, I could have been silent this whole meeting, still updated my model of the world by listening to Marcus talk here. Else talk. Um, so we have to sort of sometimes we, then we can use the model to perform behaviors. And so sometimes it goes off in a delay between when you're sort of building the model, building the model, morphing it all the time, and then we can use the model to act. Um, um, but it's not an input output thing. I, I was just like a slight disagreeing with you about that. But, but that is why I brought in this point about the forward response yeah. and the top down. Um, I kind of want to like draw something very quick. It's, it's really <laughs> just a short <laughs> idea. I, I, okay, you can it. I don't want to. I'm not going to. I promise it's not. A, I promise it's not a big idea. I'm just going to take this side. That's okay. I won't need a lot of space. So um, the idea is um, you have you have a monkey brain, right? So uh, here's two halves, right? And you you want to record from from IT, right? Say this is IT, right? So you have your your electrode here, right? So that's where you're recording. And uh, and you have your eyes, right? And so you have stimuli on a on a on a screen. And the the, the problem is uh, for like these fast kind of image flashes, right? That there's really two things that are happening. For one, there is the contralateral feed forward response. So the image here, right? So let's call this uh, the the Y part of the image, right? Is being perceived by the eye and being processed here as the as the feed forward signal 
right? So sometime after showing images here, you will get, right? So this is where you have your stimulus. And some 70 milliseconds later or so, you will start some neurons doing firing, right? Um, but the problem is there's also another pathway. There's also the other side of the image, right? And this path um, goes, in, goes in here and has a feed forward response on the other side. And then there are top down signals, right? From, from PFC. And you can, or like other superior structures. And the only way to disentangle this is actually to, to break the, the anterior commissure. So you break these areas, these brain halves apart in the, in the hindsight. So now they're only connected to PFC. Yeah. And now you have a new pylum. So there was a couple of experimenters to meet that I actually did this study. And now you have a very neat setup because uh, this is sort of now the feedback response. So now you can decide to show a stimulus only on one side. So you introduce a screen, right? So the monkey cannot see across this. And now you can show a stimulus only on this side. And then what you will get is only the top down response because the only way that there's gonna be information arriving here is not through this part because you would need an image there. But in fact, all the responses that you're gonna get are now only top-down responses, which have which you see later. So suddenly there's a signal here. And you know that this signal must have been the feedback pathway. Whereas this one, the early response was the feed forward. The problem with that time window that I have from like 70 to 140 milliseconds is that it mushes the two different responses. So some part of the response, because this one reaches to, I don't know, I would have to recheck the original figure from two meter, but it's like it starts at 70 milliseconds, which is, I guess, also why they have that period of 70 milliseconds. Yeah. And then there's like some 30, 40 milliseconds where it's the feed forward response alone. So at somewhere, I don't know, maybe at 110 or so, this start kick, starts kicking in. And so if you're now averaging from 70 to 170 milliseconds, right? you are recording both the feed-forward response, which is awesome. That is a feed-forward filter like this. But you also are intermixing that with all the, what rules are the game, right? Uh, is there a sequence in these pictures? What was the previous item? Like all the you know, contextual information you might have in higher order areas, which are not straight feed-forward filters. But the same thing you did there applies, you, you, you cut the commercial fibers, but, right. but those, those do the same thing too. The, those the, those those the projections across the hemispheres are also going to modify each cell's responses in this version. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's so why if you want to study this, yeah. if you want to separate them, you have to cut them. Well, but only you know. I my point is, if you want to study the effect of feedback, you're right. right. I'm pointing out that in our model, the feedback actually isn't the most important thing that's going on. It's it's all the horizontal connections between these columns. Right. And um and so in some sense, I so would rather, I'd rather cut the feedback if I could. We don't have to do that. So I guess what Jeff's right. saying, there's other a third category of information mixed right. again, which is all of yeah, that. So right. our, our our theory says that each single level in our cortex can recognize complete objects, and it can even recognize complete objects in a flash. Um, and and so, but it requires those those long range horizontal connections uh, between columns in that region. Right. Um, so I would even say that this system, you know, we could we can recognize stuff without feedback. Right. Yeah, so there's two things, right? There's the, the fact that there's no recurrent connections, yeah. so no, no, no connections, you know, laterally or, or, or even like this, yeah. right, between the models um, and the, in the different convolutional, you know, uh, layers. But the other problem is also that there's no feedback. So I just wanted to point out the latter yeah. one and how people have addressed it in electrophysiology, where I think that time yeah. window is really problematic. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to do that, you would have to do that with a selectively contralateral stimulus to just show this is the feed forward response. This is like a feed forward filter, which a convolutional neural network is. So if you want to draw that analogy between a, the feed forward properties of the visual system and a feed forward convolutional networks, then you should make a setup where you can actually, you know, make that analogy a little bit better, even though, you know, you know, yeah. Jeff and neuroscientists and, you know, me, when I start thinking about this, will probably still be upset, but it would be a bit better, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, that that's all I'm I think to say. this is one more example of all the ways that the biology is much more complicated than this, this level, this kind of thinking about it. 
you just can't read much into it in terms of saying, oh, we're explaining what's going on um, in the neuroscience. This is way complicated. And as stupid I just point out, machine learning people want to be able to say, yeah, we've explained this, and now we don't think. Okay, so we keep neural networks, emphasis on neural. Yeah. So you don't tell them that their composition function <laughs> a lot of them like same units. A lot of them are annoyed by saying neurons. They don't. They're not presumptuous. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a mixed crowd. Yeah, it's a mixed crowd. Yeah, I mean, our part of our goal, or one of the things we have to try to do, is bring more of the neuroscience education into the machine learning world and explain the differences and show the benefits of the things we know that the brain has been in. Yeah, and I guess focusing on all the things they're doing wrong doesn't help. But I don't yeah, know. it's right, exactly. So right. that's what I, you know, I think that's the, the approach that Super Tech laid out for us here is a great one. It's just to say, like, hey, convolutional neural networks are great, the current neural, neural networks are great. Here's how we can improve them. And uh, let's start with that. Hmm. As opposed to, like, hey, these neurons, these networks aren't like brain. Right. Is that it? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. That's all, Marcus. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Nice to hear much. Are we up there? Okay, everybody. Thank you for uh, for watching that. Thank you for watching that paper review. Hold on, let me just leave this meeting real quick. <laughs> um, so you just watched a paper review led by Marcus Lewis uh, here at Nementa headquarters in Redwood City. Um, if you like this content, please like the video. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. That would be great. I try and stream as much live stuff as I can from the office, whether it be research meetings or paper reviews like this one. There'll probably be more this week. I will be in the office Friday, probably streaming something then. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, appreciate everybody, uh, if you want to support me, likes are how <laughs> I prove this works. Um, so, uh, that's it. Take care, everyone. Have a, a wonderful day. I'll see you later on the stream.